Now what we're going to do in section 3.2 is to expand the idea of a derivative. And instead of talking about a derivative just at a point, um, we're going to think of the derivative as its own thing. Okay, so in 3.2, we have we're going to define the derivative to be its own function. Okay, so first let me let me give you like a, a motivation for that. Um, let's suppose that I have a, a graph. Okay, and I have some function. And I want to find the derivative at a point, right? That gives me the slope of the tangent line at a point. But maybe I want to find the slope of the tangent line at another point also. So maybe I, I have a different point that I want to find. You know, I won't call this one A, maybe I'll call this one, well, maybe I'll call the first one A1. So then I'll call the second one A2. Okay, and maybe I have a third one that I'll call A3. Okay, well, all of these are different tangent lines that I can have on the same graph. And what I can do is think about, you know, the slopes of those tangent lines. And wouldn't it be nice if I had just had one formula that would tell me the slope for any tangent line on a graph? Okay. Um, and and that, that's kind of what, what we're doing um, here. We're going to say, well, think of that point A as being like an unknown, right? So... Let me show you a quick example of what I mean. For f of x equals x squared, we'll have something nice and simple here. Find the slope of the tangent line. At x equals a. So I'm not telling you what number A is. I'm just saying find it at a point A, an arbitrary point A. So we say, okay, well, slope of the tangent line is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. My function is x squared, so if my input is a plus h, then... I just have a plus h squared. And if I just have an a, then my output is a squared. Okay. So then we could say, all right, let's go ahead and expand this out, right? Foil it out. a squared plus 2ah plus h squared minus my a squared. Okay, a squared minus a squared adds to zero. And everything that I have left has an h in it. So I'm going to, when I rewrite this, I'm going to factor that h out. Okay, so when I factor it out of this first term, I'm left with 2a. When I factor it out of the second term, I'm left with an h. And now I'm going to cancel my h's. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of 2a plus h. So we say, okay, well, now I can solve by direct substitution. h is approaching 0, so I'm substituting in for h. So I get 2a plus 0, which is just 2a. So if my a value was negative 1, the slope would be negative 2. Well, this isn't the right graph. Let me, let me draw x squared here. So that we're makes sense. So here's y equals x squared. Okay. So if I pick an, an a value of negative one, then I'm gonna have a slope of negative two. 
right? Because it's just it's just double, right? If I have an a value of positive one, then I'm gonna have a slope of two. If I have an a value of two, then we get a slope of four. Okay, and that seems to you know match up. I didn't draw a very uh, you know neat accurate graph here, but it's enough to get an idea. But what I've done is I've created sort of a general formula for the slope of the tangent line where I can plug in different numbers. So really I'm thinking about a as being like a variable here. So if I have a process where you have a variable input a and you can output some number, that's exactly what a function is. And what I'm looking at is the derivative at a point, but I'm not thinking of that point as being fixed. So I'm thinking of the point as being my input variable. And so the derivative then instead of just being a single fixed number slope, it's a function. Okay. All right. So So we define the derivative now as a function. For a function f, the derivative of f written f prime is f prime of x equals the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. I'm just saying we had the a's before it acted like a variable. We could call that variable x again. Okay. And the domain of f prime is all x values where the limit exists. And we're gonna we're gonna come back to that and talk about where that's uh, important in a minute. But let's first look at um, some examples here. So we don't have to talk about the context of a tangent line anymore. I can just think of computing the derivative of a function, and then if I wanted the slope of a tangent line, I would just plug a number into that function and be done. Okay. So uh, let's look at an example. Um, suppose f of x is uh, x squared minus 2x plus 1, okay, find f prime of x. Okay. So we start off with our definition, f prime of x is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And what I want to do is I want to do my work over to the side and figure out what these separate pieces are. Okay, so I already know that f of x is x squared minus 2x plus 1. So now let's figure out what f of x plus h is. I'm replacing my x with x plus h in the input. So in my formula, I replace x with x plus h. Okay. I'm not adding h to the outside of the function, so I don't just tack it onto the outside of my formula. I'm replacing x with x plus h. So I replace the x with an x plus h. So let's go ahead and simplify this. I'm going to FOIL out x plus h. Distribute this negative 2. Okay. And now let's say, well, what if I combine them together, right? So, um, well, let's plug our pieces in. We'll, we'll 
plug them in over here. So f of x plus h now is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared minus 2x minus 2h plus 1. Okay, and then f of x, I'm subtracting. So I want minus x squared uh, minus 2x plus 1. So what I'm going to do right away is distribute that negative, because I don't want to forget about it. Okay, this whole thing is divided by h. Okay, let's group like terms. x squared minus x squared adds to 0. Negative 2x plus 2x adds to 0. Plus 1 minus 1 adds to 0. Okay. That condensed pretty nicely. So we have 2xh plus h squared minus 2h. And all of that is divided by h. Okay. So now what we can do is factor an h out. So if I factor an h out of the numerator, I'm left with 2x plus h minus 2. And the reason that I did that was to cancel the h that's in the denominator. So I have 2x plus h minus 2. And with direct substitution, I'm replacing the h with 0. So f prime of x is 2x minus 2. All right, um, let's look at this another way. Let's look at graphs. Okay. So we just had an example where f of x was x squared minus 2x, and then we said that uh, the derivative you know what, let me do this, make this color coded. So I'm going to write a function f of x in blue, that's x squared minus 2x. And then I'm going to graph the derivative in orange, f prime of x, we said was 2x minus 2. And let's just look at the graph of these two together on the same screen and, and see what, what's going on here. Okay. So uh, x squared minus 2x, um, that's quadratic with zeros at 2 and 0. So <laughs> pen sticking. All right, let's try from this side. Oh, if I can't get a good graph by hand, then we're going to just go to the calculator. It's terrible. It looks like a line. Oh. All right, my aim is way off today. All right, good enough. Okay, and then if I look at the graph of 2x minus 2, that is a line. Um, okay, it's going to look something like that. All right, what's the relationship between these two? Right, when I just look at these two graphs, that doesn't really seem obvious um, that they are connected in any meaningful way. But what I want to do is notice that um, as my function f is moving down, all right, it's moving down until I get to this point here, and my 
derivative is negative for those values. Okay, because so remember what I'm doing is we define the derivative the same way we define the slope of the tangent line, right? So it's really just the slope of the tangent line. Okay, and so if I look at, say, this turnaround point here, the tangent line would be horizontal. That's a slope of zero, so my derivative has a value of zero. To the left of that, my tangent line is pointed down, so it's going to have a negative slope, but it's not pointed down by very much, so I have a small negative number. As I move over here to the left, I have a very steep, uh, steeply sloped tangent line. Okay, so the slope is going to be negative, and it's going to be very large in magnitude. So here I have a derivative whose output values, not its slope, but its y values, its outputs, are a, you know, a negative number with a lot of magnitude, right? If I look over here, as I move to the right, I have tangent lines that are sloped up and getting steeper and steeper as I go. So I want numbers in my derivative that are positive and getting bigger and bigger, right? And that, that's what we see. So that's how we can sort of make a connection between a graph and a tangent line, um, or sorry, a graph and a derivative. We think of the tangent lines to f are the y values of f prime. So we're not comparing the y values to y values, we're comparing the, the y values to, uh, sorry, the slopes to y values, right? So let's look at an, another way that we can sort of look at this. Suppose I only give you a graph of f. there's f of x, and I say, sketch a graph of f prime. Okay, how would you go about doing that, right? So what I would do is I would start with the easy parts. I would say, okay, somewhere about here, it looks like I have a horizontal tangent line. So that means that f prime is zero there. Okay, let's find all the horizontal tangent lines, right? So here, you know, the graph goes up and then comes down. Somewhere over here, it turns around. So I have this horizontal tangent line. Okay, so that means that the slope is zero. So my derivative f prime has an, a y value, an output of zero. Okay, now I'm going to look in between these two points, and I can see that the tangent lines over here are all angled down, right? Some more steeply than others, they're all angled down. Right. So if I'm very close to where the slope is zero, it's only slightly angled down. It gets steeper and steeper as I go left, and then it gets less steep. Okay. So somewhere in between, I have like a most steeply down angled. So that's going to correspond to a most negative value for, for my derivative. Okay. And then if I look maybe to the right of this point, my slopes are all positive and getting more positive as they go, right? So I want to be positive y values and getting more and more positive. Okay, likewise, back here, I'm going to have a slight positive value, a more positive value, and then a very large positive value. So as I move off to the left, I'm going to have y values that are more and more positive for my function f prime. Okay, so that's a way that we can generate a graph of f prime of x by looking at a graph of f of x. It's more difficult going the other way around, so we're not going to look at that right now. Um, but to work backwards here, oftentimes we do that in math, and we will, but we'll do that in chapter 5. Okay, now let's talk about the domain of f prime, domain and continuity.
Okay, we said that the derivative f prime has a domain everywhere where that limit that defines it exists, right? So remember that uh, f prime of x was equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, if I look at this definition, if f of x does not exist, then I can't do anything with this whole limit, right? It's just, you know, I'll have something in here that, that, that doesn't, doesn't make sense, and so the whole limit isn't going to be, I'm not going to be able to compute it, and so it, it'll be done there. So if something is not in the domain of f, it's also not in the domain of f prime. Okay, so f prime of x could have a domain as big as f, or it could be smaller, but it can't be bigger. I can't have any x values that are in the domain of f prime uh, that don't work in the, in the original function f. Okay, so it's going to be the same size or smaller right, when we talk about the domain. Um, the other thing to look at here... Um, If I think about this not as a limit, but if I, if I think about the graph and how we get a tangent line, okay, so if here's my function f, and let's suppose that we have some a value I want to find the tangent line at, okay, the way that we find the equation of the tangent line was we said, okay, pick other values nearby, connect them with a line, and as we get closer and closer, we'll approach the tangent line. But remember, limits come from both directions, so I can be bigger than a and also smaller than a, right? And as I approach, I need to approach the same tangent line. So if we end up with a situation where the tangent line from the left and right don't match, then the derivative is not going to exist at that point. So if the tangent lines are different from the left and right, then f prime of x will not exist. Okay. So let me show you some examples of when that, that might not happen. Um, if I have a function that has a break in the graph, remember that the way that we found the equation of a tangent line is we pick our point A and we pick another point on the graph and connect them with a line. So if I'm approaching from the right, I'm going to be taking two values and connecting them with a line. Okay. And so from the right, I'll get you know a tangent line that looks something like this. But if I pick values to the left of A, and I pick a value over here, and I connect them with, with my secant line, that's going to look nothing like my tangent line on the right. And as I get closer and closer to A, right, it's actually going to get steeper and steeper. It's, it's not, they're not approaching the same thing. So if you have a break in the graph, the, the tangent line's just going to get messed up. Okay. All right. We already said it doesn't work if you have a point that's undefined. Um, so really, anywhere where my function f is not continuous, we're going to have a problem with the derivative. Okay. So if f of x is not continuous at x equals a, then f prime of a does not exist. right? 
even if f of a exists. Okay, so f of a not existing is one way that f might not be continuous. But you could have a function that exists and maybe has a break in it, right, or goes off to infinity on one side or the other, or, you know, something like that. And that, that's going to make the, the derivative not exist. Okay. Um, there's going to be uh, other ways in which the derivative might not exist. So I'm, I'm going to show you um, three more examples of, of a graph where the derivative does not exist. Okay. So the first one is a very simple graph. We're just going to look at the absolute value function. Right. It's defined everywhere. It's continuous everywhere. So f of x equals absolute value of x is defined and continuous. However, f prime of 0 does not exist. Why is that? If I look as I approach from the left, my tangent lines all have slope negative 1. If I look on the right, my tangent lines all have slope 1. So when I have this point here at 0, they don't match from the left and the right. So that's a problem. Okay. So anywhere where a graph would have a sharp corner, the tangent line is going to not exist. The technical term for a sharp corner in math is a cusp. So if, if f of x has a sharp corner at, at x equals a, then f prime of a does not exist. Right. So that's one example. Oh. That's what I want. Okay. Um, let's look at another graph. Again, I'm going to give you a, a specific function here. y equals the cube root of x. Just like that absolute value function, this has domain all real numbers and is continuous on all real numbers. However, at 0, if I look at the graph of the tangent line, it goes straight up and down. So that line doesn't have a slope, and the derivative is slope of the tangent line. So the derivative there doesn't exist. So even though there is a tangent line there, um, it doesn't have a, that line doesn't have a slope, so the derivative doesn't exist. So the tangent line to f of x equals the cube root of x at x equals 0 is vertical, so f prime of 0 does not exist. Okay, and we'll give a third example here where we can have a function that's nicely behaved and continuous, but the derivative doesn't exist. This is going to be a messy function though. So let's look at like f of x, and I'm going to define this piecewise, so x times sine of 1 over x, x is not equal to 0, and it's 0 if x is equal to 0. Okay, and first I'm going to have my calculator graph it, and I'll show you what this is going to look like. Oops. 
So we have x times the sine of 1 over x. Um, let me zoom in a bit. Okay, so here you can see the graph starts wiggling up and down really, really quickly as I as I approach zero. And in this case, um, you know, this is, I think, an, an example of a problem that we saw with the squeeze theorem. I can actually get a limit at zero, even though it doesn't exist at, at zero, except that it kind of does exist at zero, because when we define it piecewise, we can fill in the hole that we would get at zero. Okay, so we, we've actually patched this function up to to be okay. Um, the difficulty though is with the slopes, right? Because this function is wiggling up and down all over the place, there's no way to pin down what the slope would be. It's not approaching anything. The function we've sort of reined in, and again I think the calculator gives me a nicer graph, because it's kind of getting squeezed in between x and negative x here. Okay, So it's, it's being squeezed in as we get towards zero but the slopes are not. It's wiggling faster and faster, so the slopes are getting more out of control, not less. Okay, so we could have a function that just oscillates out of control and, and the derivative might not exist. Okay. So, for a function f, derivative now, prime of x is a function okay so if a function has a derivative and f prime is a function that means that f prime can have a derivative so if i take f prime and I want to write its derivative, what we're going to do is we're going to call this the second derivative. Okay, and we're going to have a way to write this, but what I want to do, if we're going to start to talk about derivative of derivatives, I want to maybe show you some of the many different ways that we have of writing derivatives. So I just gave you this one where we have this prime notation. Uh, this is not notation that either Leibniz nor Newton had when they were, you know, coming up with calculus originally. Okay, so th this was, an, you know, sort of coined later. Um, I think that Euler either, either invented it or made it popular. He was a Swiss mathematician that came, you know, roughly 100 years later than, than Newton and Leibniz did. Okay, so um, let me show you some different ways that, that we can, uh, you know, have a function and, and derivatives, okay? So I can write a function as f of x, and the derivative is f prime of x, and the second derivative is f double prime of x, and the third derivative is f triple prime of x. If I want to use a derivative higher than that, we stop using these little hash marks because we don't want to count past three. And what we do instead is we just write the number for the derivative in parentheses. So if I put like a little four in parentheses here, then this is the notation for the fourth derivative. Okay. If instead of writing f of x, if I just write like y equals f of x, then I could do the same thing just writing y's. So sometimes we could write like y of x, or we could just write y by itself, right? And then the derivative would be y prime, y double prime, y triple prime, fourth derivative, right, and, um, and, and so on, right? Okay, um, the notation that Newton used, so I think that this one is Euler's, um, 
the notation that Newton used was with these y's, but he just put a dot over it. Oops, not over, not over the original function though. So um, it's it's actually pretty close to what we're using now. Um, you know, and then two dots, three dots. He had no limit to the number of dots though. Okay. Um, because he wasn't really thinking of, of derivatives that, that would keep going up really, really high. If I think in terms of like motion, if I have a function that represents position, then the first derivative we already talked about would be like velocity. The second derivative would be acceleration. The third derivative is something that you can talk about in physics. It's a change in acceleration, which you can call a jerk, right? So if you think of like, you know, a roller coaster, maybe you're you know, moving around a corner, you know, taking a turn, you, know, you can think of this in a car too. If you suddenly change that, you know, following a turn, you have an acceleration. If you suddenly change your trajectory so that you're not turning in one direction, but you're turning in another, okay, then, then you would feel a, a jerk as you have a sudden change in that acceleration, you know, on, on you. Okay, so you have a third derivative that can map that, and, and, and there's some names for these. Um, but in terms of motion that you know, as, as you start to get higher up, it starts to get a little bit abstract and doesn't really give you good information. Okay, um, so so Newton didn't really think of this going higher, but in other applications that, that can be really important. Okay, another notation that we're going to look at that we are going to use in this class and, and you would use in other math classes beyond this is Leibniz notation. Leibniz notation, um, when we're looking at a function f, if I just think of the f by itself, right, if I look at this y, there's no mention of the variable. Leibniz's notation built that all in so that I can see the function and the variable all at once. So if he had a function like y, where my variable is x, then the derivative would be dy over dx, and that seems very complicated, right? Like, oh, I don't like that, it's too, too much stuff here. Um, but the idea was I'm looking at the difference of y's over the difference of x's, and I believe that that's where he came up with this notation, right? Okay. And now what we would have if I wanted to take the derivative of the derivative is I want the, you know, the difference of the differences, right? So, um, what he would do is, if you think of this whole thing as being my function, we would have d dy dx over dx. Well, he didn't write it like that, but what you could think of is I'm doubling up the, the you know, the d on the y's and doubling up the dx's, okay? So the way that he would write this would be d squared y over dx squared, okay? d cubed y over dx cubed, and since it's already numbers, um, you know, there's no problem scaling this up to higher derivatives. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that this notation can really be helpful when I'm writing the derivative as a thing, like a noun, then, you know, I can see all of these notations are just different ways of writing it. With Leibniz notation, it's easier to make the process of finding a derivative a verb and, and have a notation for writing that. So what we could do is we could say, all right, here's my y, and here I have the derivative of y, and if I just take the y out, then I would have this d over dx, and I can think of that as being the act of taking the derivative of something, okay? So, um, so if I point to these things, These are the derivative of y. Okay. And then I could also look separately at this idea if I write d over dx and then I put a function inside like y, then this means to differentiate y.
Okay, so that's an action word, right? That's a verb. Okay, derivative is a noun. Okay, so the derivative of y is a thing. Um, to find the derivative is to differentiate. Okay, as a side note, um, deriving something is not the same as differentiating. Okay, so to find a derivative is to differentiate. not to derive. Okay, uh, to derive something, um, we have a, a separate meaning that we assign in math to that. So for example, if I want to know the formula for area of a circle, when I derive that formula, that means that I'm, I'm coming up with that formula. I'm, I'm figuring out why, you know, what, what that formula is, you know, based on something else. Okay. Um, this differentiating is, is this process of, of coming up with this new function based on slopes of tangent lines. Okay, so it's um, it, it has a, a different meaning, so we want to we want to be careful and we use a different word for it, even though the they sound the same. All right, so that is it for three point two.